one of the great challenges of spiritual maturity is to sort out in your life the meaning between intentions and results. And we're probably all struggling with that. We all have good intentions about a lot of things. Uh, the electorate had that. Good intentions for a lot of people and completely different results have happened. And then when that happens in your life on any issue, whether it's personal, collective, or whatever, uh, the challenge illustrates for us that there's also a, a margin that we have to pay attention to, which is called freedom. And uh, this freedom is experienced very really, but we also admit to ourselves that our notion of what we think freedom is, is sometimes very limited. And we only understand the measure of its uh, uh, impact on our lives or on others in, uh, in degrees as we make a journey or the pilgrimage of life, as we call it, in spirituality. Uh, an author, Alistair McIntyre, wrote a book uh, called Stories many years ago. And he illustrated in that book that uh, the uh, People who, uh, all of us, we are about uh, doing a co-narrative about our lives all our, all our life long. It's a co-narrative because the narrative is intersected by many things that are out of our control. Or many things unforeseen that we couldn't even begin to imagine uh, would take place in our lifetime. And this uh, narrative that we co-author as we write our own story uh, is something that causes us to uh, experience causes, effects, choices, chances, and how they emerge in our life. But also it, it calls us to make a decision on how much of value we place in them as uh, something that's really substantive and calling us, especially as Christians, to our willingness to allow God providentially to guide and aid us at all times, because we've come to believe that the words of Jesus, behold, I am with you all days until the end of the world. But when you really experience this uh, uh, challenge in your life between intentions and results, oftentimes you find that your ability to freely believe that perhaps is lacking. <laughs> it was so much lacking at the time when uh, Sigmund Freud was alive. He wrote a letter to uh, Mrs. Maria Bonaparte. She wasn't uh, kin to Napoleon. <laughs> but she had inquired with him about uh, the meaning of life. His uh, letter in response to her began to stamp the uh, 18th, late 18th, early 19th century and beyond, even to our own time. In his response, he said <clears throat> to her, um, to uh, hope of finding meaning and value in life is insane. And thus he abandoned, uh, uh, you know, the humankind's approach to a meaningful world, but that it was a meaningless world. He later on would say in the next sentence, it's a meaningless world. Now, this observation was made by another author, uh, Philip Reif, who wrote uh, The Triumph of the Therapeutic. I don't know if you've ever read that, but it's a powerful book. <laughs> Philip Reif uh, wrote uh, back in the uh, early 20th century. But it had an effect on us uh, as a Western society because we put a lot of counsel into Freud rather than into Jung you know, and, and others who followed him. <laughs> and so you can see uh, here's a very uh, uh, lettered European, very well studied in, uh, in human behavior and things like that as a scientist of life, but still ending up with uh, a very empty perspective. When we think of this passage from the gospel today and also the passage about the prophet who comes to another widow, there's interesting parallels that were uh, selected here. 
there's an important uh, thing to remember that when we think of miracles, uh, I was told by a Jesuit scholar uh, years ago in Europe, we were uh, studying some sacred scripture in the Old Testament and knew, and he remarked, he said, remember that, and he used this passage from Mark and also from Isaiah, he said, remember that miracles are something you participate in. You have to bring something to the table, and then you gotta let it go to God and let God providentially deal with it. But it's always a cooperative effort. <laughs> and never like magic. A lot of people, and I think all of us can find in our, our lives that sometimes we want more magic because Magic, you know, puts us in an egocentric control. God and gods or fairies or whatever are going to do what I want. That's the bottom line of magic. To do what you want. It doesn't matter whether black magic, white magic, it all ends up in the ego. Egocentrism, as we would probably call it. <clears throat> but with, with the mystery, of miracle because we believe in a participatory God who is in relation to the creation relationship and relationship to us in the Judeo-Christian belief is that God is not any further away than the end of your nose and actually beyond your nose into your lungs and everything else. But, <laughs> but God always humbly approaches us uh, with great humility and respect about how we uh, and how the wonder of life and all of the visages of things that evolve in one's life, uh, how we're going to uh, walk with God's presence and at the same time walk in trust, but also find uh, the celebration and the wonder and the capacity to uh, live a full life, whether it's in tragedy or in beauty, wonder, and triumph. And it's there where that transcendent experience of God's relationship of love, which would be another word for grace, uh, affects in us, but yet doesn't abandon us to just do it alone, but at the same time upholds uh, what we can be and what we can become by doing the grace within ourselves and for others, you might say. You know, life is sort of like a tree. You've probably heard this expression. If you look at the rings of aging in a tree, it's an interesting metaphor for human life because they're recorded for a tree that a tree has to stay in place all its life. It doesn't get up and walk around like in Tolkien, but, <laughs> but the important thing is that the tree has to weather so much, changes that are beyond its power to have life. Uh, and it's one of the oldest existing species on the earth outside of insects, incidentally, in the evolutionary scale of things. And, uh, and when you think of it, you, you see a down tree or something like that, you can read and scientists do this now. They read whether, whether there was more diseases, whether more drought, more winters, and so forth. And how, and the further study is, is how the tree adapted, how the, how the tree uh, experienced this, and what was the result of how it continues to stay in place and be alive and still self-giving, both in its root systems and in its branches and leaves to so many other uh, 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 creatures of, of this planet. So it causes us to think that, okay, one of the aspects of miracle is to create alterations. <laughs> that God can inspire us in such a way as to make alterations in our life. Now, <clears throat> the woman who is the widow in, uh, in the... Uh, the story of the prophet, she's making an alteration when the prophet comes on the scene. 
And uh, she does the courtesy of her faith, which was when a stranger came, you offer them what you had, uh, and they came by your household, like if it were water or anything like that, because the ancient belief in Israel was you might be an entertaining an angel. And that's still persistent in Bedouin uh, practice in Egypt, if you ever go there. So there was this really strong belief that there would be a favor granted. It all goes back to Abraham, you know, and the three mysterious strangers who show up and prophesy that Sarah's going to be pregnant the next time they come around. <laughs> and of course, both him and Sarah are in disbelief, of course, at this. But if you watch the actions of Abraham, he participates in, in that miracle that's going to happen to Sarah. And Sarah, she also participates, even though she laughs in the tent uh, uh, at this ridiculous uh, prophecy that these three strangers give. Well, this same uh, story line is humming to us today in the first reading. But uh, the widow is at the end of her tether. You know, she's been su surviving famine with her son. She's a widow and she's a woman and she has no economy other than probably the jewelry she might have had and it's probably all already gone because all she's got left is a few sticks and to make a fire and a little flour and oil to make a cake and then she knows that her son's going to die and she's going to die of starvation too. But what she does is she participates in this mysterious utterance of this prophecy by faith and she gives the little that she has, which was to survive just maybe another few days, and give, give this to the stranger, hoping for a blessing. And of course, miraculously, we're told that she's, it's prophesied to her that, you know, the flour's not going to run out and the oil's not going to run out, you know. And then you see Jesus acclaiming and affirming this type of response <clears throat> because the widow who comes to the treasury, she's not expecting anything back, uh, but she's very faithful. But uh, he uses it very much to illustrate to his disciples uh, what it really means to give from the substance of your life and allow uh, a pathway for providence to really uh, demonstrate for you how close and how wonderful it is. And here you have Jesus uh, symbolically, more than symbolically, looking into her heart and life and seeing the depth of which God really treasures this great woman who actually lives and mirrors back to Jesus what it's going to cost him on the cross. He's going to have to give not from the excesses of his life and ability. He's going to have to give out of the absolute essence of himself and give it away entirely in death for a greater miracle, to save the human race for all ages and the universe. So he's seeing in there a prophecy coming through her. <laughs> and he's affirming that prophecy to others that will have to follow this same way. St. John Paul II wrote an encyclical some years back before his passing about the economy, I think it was, and I can't remember the Latin term right offhand, pardon me, but in there he said to the world and especially the church, he said, God has called you uh, to give not merely from your surplus, but from the substance of your life. And he was calling the church to take a risk, a great risk, to divest itself in such a way as to help the poor of the nations. And that every opportunity that we have as a disciple, if we're really wanting a miracle, <clears throat> We open ourselves to that providence that says, I can trust God and I can do for that for another person. That which I would hope if I were in their shoes uh, would be done for me.
and celebrate that as an actual miracle of God's providence with us. See, a lot of times when we look at miracles, we, we, we want to see bright lights and fireworks and everything around it. But miracles that I have witnessed a lot of times in life are much, much, much more subtle than that because it's, it's involved with the transformation of a human person's not so much sometimes that it can transform everything about the situation <clears throat> that they're in, but something really divine, something beautiful, something uh, like Mother Teresa had said, do something beautiful for God. That was her response. <laughs> do something beautiful for God, because God's given you the power to do that, to act like God in behalf of another. <clears throat> I remember, I think I told you this story, but I'll repeat it just because I think it's a good thing to, for me, <laughs> if not for you. Uh, I was in Honduras in, during the Nicaraguan Revolution, and this little, I'd gone three days on horseback with another priest uh, uh, to uh, visit this village that hadn't seen a priest in over two years. And they were all indigenous people. They lived on this one mountain. They had their own language and everything. Wonderful people. And they were entirely Catholic. And so we went there. And the moment that I uh, got there, I got off my horse. And the horse had stepped into a big ant hill. And they were those uh, soldier ants, you know, kind of thing. So they're not fun to play with. And the horse started jumping as I was trying to get my toe out of the stirrup. And I fell to the ground. And of course, the horse was kicking and ran off. And, and then uh, Father Michael came over and the two vaqueros and said, are you OK? And then the ants were just pouring out of there like this red blood stream. And all of a sudden, this little boy who was about, uh, uh, probably about two, about three years ago, had just learned to walk, I would think. He steps on his father's machete and cuts his foot in half, all the way up to the bone. Blood flowing everywhere, and you got the red ants on one thing, you got this little boy bleeding and turning white. And we only had band-aids uh, and some gauze and some you know, uh, antiseptic cream. So I ran over to him. His mother was uh, hysterical. She had been in trying to fix food, uh, some tortillas for us. And so there she is, blood all over in front of her. And so I started holding his foot together as I knelt before him. And his little sister, who was about six years old, was standing there watching all this. And I knew that it's, it, it felt like, as much as I was praying, it felt like I felt extremely powerless, nothing to do, and the, other than do what I could, which was to comfort and bandage the foot together and uh, do what I could do, and put a tourniquet, but not so tightly. So after doing that, <laughs> I walk off and I thought, I'm just, I just need to clear my head. So I walked down uh, uh, towards this little stream that ran below the village. And this little girl, her shadow, I saw her shadow uh, beside me and she came up and took my hand. And uh, we sat down by the stream together and she had, um, she had a little tangerine, beautiful golden tangerine in her hand. And she looked up at me as I was staring at both of our faces in the stream. And she put the tangerine in my hand. And I wrote a poem called The Little, The Girl with Sun in Her Hand. The importance of this <clears throat> was the widow's might. Because at that time, all the produce that was being produced for General Foods Corporation and Dole, the best fruit was being shipped off to the country. And the people of Honduras always had the poorest of anything that was left. 
but a tangerine for a little five-year-old girl was like having a banquet. And she gave her banquet away to me. And that's when I learned, too, the meaning of this passage, these two passages. Give of your substance, as St. John Paul II, and that kept ringing, you know, uh, over this lifetime that I've had. <clears throat> and, it, and it really started me an understanding that we have to have a passionate knowledge, and that's what happened in the heart and spirit of this little girl in the middle of that village on a mountain in Honduras years ago. She had a passionate knowledge gifted to her by God of what God would do. And she was only five years old, couldn't read and write. <laughs> but if she were a, she was a saint, <laughs> in my estimation. Life can be read like rings, even in a small tree, a, even a tree that's just a sapling, has a story to tell us. So we never put our, we never put our to, total uh, emphasis on just what we can do, but also what God will do within us and give us the power to do, uh, even in our limitations. There's sobering treks for us all ahead, but isn't a pilgrimage in faith that, in truth? You know, the, the way uh, we used to say, um, uh, we used to talk about journey. I think it was Joseph Campbell who said uh, one time that the word journey uh, really came from the distance you could travel in one day. And maybe we only have one day. But one day, as the scriptures tell us, is uh, one day in uh, God's imagination is like a thousand lifetimes, you know, a thousand years. And, uh, and you often hear in our culture, are we there yet? <laughs> Most of it's derogative, our signs to its impatience, uh, or marginalizes people that we might be around, or their intelligence, or their abilities. Are we there yet? Imagine a teacher or a professor saying that to you and you're trying to learn. But imagine that on a spiritual level, <clears throat> if I'm carrying that kind of attitude with the very energy that I could turn to love and support and say we're on a journey together, but you just need my help and I need yours. Pilgrimages often bring us to very different uh, different uh, destinations at times, but the destination, the closer we get to it, all of a sudden we, we realize another destination is even further. Grace is that mystery of working in our lives, the destination that God has already revealed, <clears throat> but it is not without its challenges, not without its struggle, not without asking of us, give of the substance of your heart whatever that mean, means for you and your conscience. And from that will flower, you know, a new creation. Intentions are definitely to be discerned as opposed to the results we expect. And I'm sure that little girl who I hope grew up to a womanhood and uh, the fullness of her life uh, is still uh, putting uh, a piece of sun in the world and in the hearts of others.